My name is uh, Francis, and I think uh, most of us have met before. I'm very delighted that you come early this Thursday morning and to listen to uh, Gudrun Hacker, who is an old friend of mine. Um, and uh, more important, maybe, uh, she is uh, one of the outstanding European experts on East Asia and East Asian issues. Gudrun and I, we have a history that goes quite a while back on a second track dialogue on issues such as the South China Sea, Dao Tai, Taiwan, cross range relations. And uh, she's been working on Vietnam before. I'm very happy that we were able to invite her through our outreach project. So thanks to Marion and her colleagues for doing that. And uh, you've been here now for a week, speaking in different cities in Vietnam. And uh, today, we'll be spending the whole day uh, in different groups in Hanoi. Very happy to see the diplomatic class, many from the diplomatic corps here, um, excellencies, ambassadors, and the uh, senior and other diplomats, and also from the, the different uh, target groups that we have in the delegation, and of course also my own colleagues here. I felt for quite some years that uh, Europe is not investing enough uh, research in East Asia. It's a region that's uh, very dynamic, growing very fast, and it's also a region that would be very complementary to the European Union in the decades to come. And uh, I feel quite strongly that uh, we should know much more about the developments here. And therefore, I'm very happy that Dave uh, Woodrow has been working so intensively, intensively on these questions for years now. So thank you very much for coming, and we're looking forward to listening to you. Okay. Thank you, Frank, for the kind introduction. Let's see whether I can work this screen here. Um, I, I actually was very happy to come here, and I think I will try within something like 10 minutes to the first email because I have never been to Vietnam. I have traveled in many other Asian countries and I go to China as often as I can to get a feeling of the atmosphere there. But somehow it never worked for me to come to Vietnam. So I was very happy to receive this uh, invitation and have an opportunity to speak here and get a better uh, personal insight in, into this country. Um, so far, I have spoken in front of students, so this is a totally different audience now. Uh, maybe I'll say one sentence on my institute, uh, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. It's called Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in German, but the acronym SWP always um, creates misunderstandings because in England, for example, it's the acronym for the Socialist Workers' Party, so I avoid SWP uh, in English. It's a think tank that is fully funded by the government, uh, by the German Chancellor's Office, not by the Foreign Ministry, and our main task is to give advice to not only the ministries, but also the parliament, the German parliament, on foreign and security policy. So I think without <coughs> further ado, I start with uh, my presentation. I thought I'd pick a topic which should be of interest to Vietnam as well, because the pivot to Asia of the United States or the rebalancing um, also has affected Vietnam and it has been a rapprochement that came as a surprise to many people, but probably is not so surprising after all. So let's get started. Yeah, this is what I will try to do in the next 25 minutes. Um, first uh, point is what, what do I mean when I speak about pivot to Asia? What does the US mean by Asia? What is our definition in the EU of Asia? Because, I mean, Asia is a construct. Uh, then the U.S. pivot and rebalancing, I will speak a bit about the background and what dimensions, what um, components the U.S. pivot has. Um, I will try to answer whether this is a sustainable project of the United States or not, because I think there are some concerns 
about the sustainability, and I will speak a, a little bit about the responses uh, in Asia and then responses from the EU. And uh, I will speak about the position of the EU in the Asia-Pacific region, the, the fundamentals investment trade, ODA, and uh, I will raise the question of a bigger role of the EU in security issues. So, um, let's get started. <coughs> the EU has published two Asia strategy papers, and each gives a different uh, definition of Asia. The first paper was published in 1994, and it said something like East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. In the 2001 paper, it says Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Australia Asia was included because Australia and New Zealand had grown so close to the Asia Pacific region that they needed to be included. Um, we always exclude Central Asia because it's still considered part of the post Soviet space. And I think the uh, recent events in Ukraine uh, show that there is a certain logic behind that to still consider the uh, post Soviet countries and the post Soviet space as something separate. So Central Asia is not uh, handled in the Asian departments, in most foreign ministries in, in Europe, I believe, but also in the United States. Uh, for this presentation, um, the definition of Asia, which I believe is also the one that the U.S. is talking about when they speak about the rebalancing, is the original members of the East Asian Summit. That means the 10 ASEAN countries plus China, Japan, Korea, uh, plus India, Australia, New Zealand, maybe Mongolia should also be included in this list. And of course, a country that is not considered a country or not recognized as a country, which is Taiwan. So uh, we could say Asia Pacific plus India. <coughs> now, the, to the US pivot of rebalancing the background, I think uh, in the beginning, when the uh, first Obama administration came into office, nobody spoke about pivot or rebalancing. But it was clear that there would be a new, a fresh initiative uh, towards Asia. Obama declared himself to be the first Pacific um, president of the United States. And this was considered to be a restoration of the normal uh, state of affairs. Um, traditionally, the US has played a very special role in this region, which is very different from the role of the US in the EU or in Europe, <coughs> it has been the provider of security um, to this region, the main provider of security after World War II, um, sometimes probably also a provider of insecurity, but um, this is the major role. Uh, this is uh, founded on five military alliances of the United States in this region. Um, this system is called hub and spoke, so the U.S. is the hub and the spokes are the five uh, military alliances with Japan, Korea, Australia, the Philippines, and Thailand. Uh, these military alliances are very different in, in nature, um, but um, they are the fundament of, um, of security, the hard wire of security in, in East Asia. Um, when finally there was talk about the pivot or rebalancing, I think the pivot was really an invention of Kurt Temple uh, in, in the um, Department of State. Um, it at first encompassed three components. One was to reinforce these traditional alliances. The second component, which we have almost forgotten now, was to offer China a very broad based cooperation on all issues. Uh, some even spoke of a G2 concept, um, uh, a world where the US and, and China would share power. The US government never spoke of that, but other advisors and former members of the government did. 
And the third component was to be a more active engagement in the regional organizations um, in Asia. We can also um, discern three dimensions of the rebalancing. The first and probably most publicized in the newspapers is the military dimension, uh, where it was declared that um, the Navy uh, engagement of the US would shift from 50-50 Atlantic to Pacific to a 60-40, so that only 40% would remain in the Atlantic and Mediterranean and 60% would be Pacific and um, Indian Ocean. The second dimension is a political one. There were a lot of uh, diplomatic initiatives. Um, for example, vis-a-vis um, Myanmar, this outreach to Myanmar, which was, had really been the stumbling block or an obstacle for deeper relationship between the United States and ASEAN as well. And then there is the <coughs> economic dimension, um, which basically is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, we don't know yet whether this will be successful or not. There is a lot of uh, obstacles on the way. But I think this trade, free trade agreement uh, that is supposed to include countries like Vietnam as well, and the United States and many uh, Asia-Pacific countries, um, this is a big economic project um, that is linked to the rebalancing. <coughs> we see these aspects um, even in the first trips um, of Clinton and Obama being south to Asia. Um, Clinton traveled to Asia in February 2009 and she visited Japan, China, Korea and Indonesia. So Japan and Korea being traditional allies, China the new possible cooperation partner, and Indonesia not only because Indonesia is an important Southeast Asian country, but also because it's the seat of the ASEAN Secretariat where uh, Hillary Clinton signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with the ASEAN countries. Uh, and this is sort of a precondition to become a full member of the East Asian Summit. Now the EU has uh, struggled for years to uh, sign the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, but I think the treaty had to be somehow adjusted because <coughs> we saw a group, the entire group of countries uh, had exceeded. Um, but uh, finally in 2012, uh, Lady Ashton could sign the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation the U.S. did this in record time. They did it within a couple of months, and uh, one year later they were accepted as a member of the East Asian Summit together with Russia. Um, so there you see the three parts. Strengthen the alliances, offer China cooperation, and stronger engagement in the regional organizations. Uh, in this case, ASEAN, all ASEAN central organizations. And if you look at Obama's first trip in November 2009, basically he also covers Japan, Korea, uh, Singapore as a Southeast Asian country, and China, where he actually made this very broad-based offer. Um, from the US perspective, this was sort of returning to the normal state of affairs in the Asia Pacific because Many people, many academics, many think tanks in the U.S. have criticized the um, time under Bush, uh, the two administ Bush administrations. They said the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had distracted the U.S. attention from the Asia Pacific and that uh, the, China, uh, the U.S. had left the initiative to China and the scope of China eating the U.S.'s lunch in, in the Asia-Pacific region. <coughs> but also, some people warned when there was first talk about the rebalancing that there are um, very serious financial constraints. I mean, we are talking about the aftermath of the global financial crisis that hit the U.S. very hard. So it's clear there have to be some cuts in military expenditure, for example. Um, 
And others argue that the U.S. cannot return to the Asia Pacific because they have actually never left. Um, we have to understand, though, that um, the rebalancing to Asia is probably one of the few bipartisan consensus topics in the United States. I mean, everything else is hotly debated, and uh, there is a, a blockade in the United States. But I think this strong focus on the Asia Pacific is a very uh, a thing where everybody can agree on, and therefore it also did not play any role in the campaign in uh, the last presidential campaign in the United States. So, um, final point on the pivot or rebalancing itself is the question of sustainability. Um, first of all, there have been some personnel changes uh, in the State Department and the Department of Defense in the United States. So the people who were the main um, carriers, if you want, for uh, the, the rebalancing, they have left, Louis Clinton has left, um, Panetta has left, and the uh, two people now filling these positions are more um, inclined to towards the transatlantic or transatlantic uh, relationship, I think although they still talk about rebalancing. The second, I already mentioned, is the financial situation in the United States. The, the cuts that will be necessary in military expenditure, they raise some question about the military posture of the United States, including in, in this region. And then finally, you have the domestic blockade, uh, the situation in the US Congress, and basically has decided to block everything that comes from the White House. Um, this raises questions about the TPP, even if the negotiations are, uh, should be successful, um, it, there might be no approval from the Congress to, to this huge FTA, and the same of course is true for TPIP, the big FTA project the US and the European Union have set out to do. Um, in a way, I, I put a picture here that is sort of symbolizing the domestic problem that the US is facing. Uh, this is a big picture of the APEC summit in Indonesia in 2013, and you see how Lee Keqiang, uh, no, Xi Jinping is taking center stage uh, in the first row and in, in the very back row on the far right. You see Secretary of State Kerry, who had to fill in for Obama, who could not go uh, to the APEC summit because of the shutdown of the uh, US government. So uh, I think, in a way, this was symbolic for the obstacles that the United States is facing. And I think it raised a lot of concerns in this region um, how sustainable the rebalancing will be and how reliable this will be. Um, now, if we look at the responses on the side of the uh, Asian countries, the first we have to say very clearly is that China was not prepared to take on this offer for a broader partnership with the United States. Um, if you talk to Chinese academics, they will tell you that the G2 idea is a trap set out for China to lure them into taking a role that they are not ready to take on, uh, that they spend money on, on global issues, uh, which then they cannot spend on, on domestic development, so to speak. So, um, and I also think that um, <coughs> China saw the offer uh, coming from the United States maybe as a sign of weakness and a, a signal that the U.S. is in decline in this region. So they didn't fall for it, and I think that um, the response afterwards in the U.S. media was that uh, this was a, a rather a failure, this trip of Obama to China. We can also see that China has uh, acted in a much more assertive way than before, after 
of <coughs> its territorial claims in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. It's insisting on a bilateral approach in addressing uh, the territorial conflicts that exist. And I think the explanation is, on the one hand, um, that China has gained some self-confidence. Uh, there were these international events in China, the, um, first the Olympic Games and then the Expo in, in Shanghai. But mostly it's uh, the global financial crisis that showed from the Chinese perspective that capitalism has run its course, so to speak, and uh, that the, the Western capitalist systems are, are rotten. Um, so there was more self-confidence in China, and probably this contributes to the sort of negative uh, response to the, I wouldn't call it a G2 often, because the US government, of course, never spoke of G2. Um, most worried, uh, China is most worried about the economic dimension of the pivot. The, if you read um, what was published in China about the balancing effort, it's always TPP that comes up because um, in the beginning it explicitly excluded China from joining. This has changed a little bit and China has modified its stance, but this was what they were most concerned about. Um, in Southeast Asia, I think the um, rebalancing was uh, welcomed by most states because the uh, countries here are um, inviting a strong U.S. presence. Um, although they do not want to choose between the U.S. and China, uh, they would like to have the U.S. as a security partner in case something goes wrong with the peaceful rise of China. But China is too important as an economic partner for the countries in, in uh, Southeast Asia, but also for Korea, for example. So the strategy here is soft hedging to invite the US to, to stay engaged in the region, uh, but not to sort of gang up against China, maybe with the exception of a few countries, the Philippines. Um, and Japan, this is the most difficult uh, relationship at the moment between China and uh, Japan. So finally, we come to the EU. I think the <coughs> initial reaction um, was, first of all, to focus on Europe itself and to, uh, there was this fear of abandonment, this uh, concern that uh, this signals the slow exit uh, of the United States from Europe. Um, despite the end of the Cold War, um, the U.S. military presence in Europe was still very strong, um, even after 2000. Uh, and uh, you know that we are, most of the European member states are also in NATO, so this collective security uh, organization has guaranteed um, security in Europe and, and um, more and more also in the neighborhood. So the reaction at first was concern about uh, disengagement of the United States, which would mean more responsibility for the EU, including in military terms. And this was put to the test uh, rather fast with the Libya campaign that also demonstrated the limits of the EU military capabilities. Uh, some of my colleagues have, have written a brief start to disengage from Europe, from the Middle East, from the Near East, um, was taken, lifted from the Europeans when um, Clinton and Panetta came to the Munich Security Conference and signaled very clearly that the transatlantic partnership is still going strong, but they also made very clear that they expect the EU to become more a producer of uh, security instead of only a consumer 
So this is basically um, the response that consoles Europe itself. In a second step, um, the EU and European countries realized that this would also have implications for their position and relationship with Asia. Um, the, the challenge for the EU is really how to position itself in this part of the world. Should we have, and I think this is still a, a question that needs to be debated, um, does the EU take a more independent stance or should there be a method to bring about transatlantic cooperation and coordination in Asia? If yes, what, what would this look like? Uh, I think we see a, a strengthening of the common foreign and defense policy or security policy after the Treaty of Lisbon and of course we have now a high representative uh, for the EU's foreign policy. We have the external action service that strengthens the representation of the European Union in other countries. But if you look at um, the focus of Asia policy in the first two years after the Treaty of Lisbon and the close, there was a very strong focus uh, on China and not on the rest of Asia. Uh, Lady Ashton traveled to China a couple of times uh, but did not attend any of the regional meetings um, in Southeast Asia. And uh, if we talk about ASEAN centrality, this is clearly, it has to change, um, and there should be more focus on ASEAN as well. Um, but underlying all this, I mean, there is very little capacity that can even go to um, the regions that are further away from the European Union, because traditionally, the focus of the EU is on itself, and you will constantly involved in some EU internal project and challenge, uh, the European debt crisis, the constitutional treaty, you name it, and then there are many crises around the EU, um, so the neighborhood is the other very strong focus of the EU, and to show you that the EU does have some real engagement on the ground in other countries, I took from the uh, external action service website. These are the ongoing missions and operations in which the EU is strongly involved. And you can see that geographically this is basically in the uh, neighborhood of the European Union and in countries that um, have an impact on, on EU security. Um, <coughs> so it's basically Balkans, Africa, Afghanistan is still ongoing mission there and the anti-piracy uh, mission <coughs> at the Horn of Africa. But uh, I think this last mission also already shows us that there is a strong interest of the EU and the Europeans in the security situation in the Asia Pacific region. So um, what are the goals of the European Union in Asia, uh, this is not in your, uh, in, in your printout because I added this after realizing that I never listed the goals. Um, this is taken from uh, the uh, foreign and security guidelines of East Asia. Uh, some of these uh, goals are global, so to speak. They don't only apply to, to East Asia. <coughs> Uh, but also to the rest of the world, so maintain peace and stability, um, <coughs> support a rules-based international order based on the UN Charter, support regional integration, and I think here ASEAN does play a very big role from the EU perspective, which also manifests itself in very concrete support for ASEAN. Uh, on the domestic level, it's rule of law, democracy, and human rights. Um, and also a global um, issue, prevent proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and address global challenges like climate change, energy security, and here the Asian countries are considered political partners of the EU. 
So um, the, the next slides are about the, the real endocrine um, of the relationship between the EU and the Asia Pacific region, and we can go through that uh, very quickly because you probably know the figures better than I do. Um, for example, the first figure is wrong. Uh, the new uh, the, uh, numbers I found um, say that the EU is the biggest source of FDI for ASEAN countries and their share is 24% um, of the FDI to, to ASEAN countries. Um, then in terms of trade, this explains a little bit why there is this strong bias towards China. If you look at the red columns, how fa fast they grow and how they um, are out of the scale almost, um, this is the trade with China, uh, the imports and the exports all quite um, substantial, but you also see that ASEAN has become the second um, biggest trading partner for the EU in Asia. It's not Japan anymore, it's, it's ASEAN. Uh, it sort of stagnates a little bit, which is uh, due to the um, crisis global financial crisis <coughs> and the European debt crisis. Um, so these are the imports um, compared to US imports from Asia. Again, you see that um, China in both cases is a very important partner, but um, for us, ASEAN is more important than uh, Japan, and in the US case, it's the other way around. You also see that India is still, there is still more potential than actual trade and uh, economic interaction going on, but people are still very modest. Um, here are the ODA numbers. They are taken, taken from the OECD website because I think they have a sort of unified standard to measure them. It's, this is again comparing the EU and the US. Uh, maybe we will um, pass by China very soon. I don't know, but they are maybe giving credits while we are really giving development for aid. Um, you can see that in both cases, the US and the EU, um, South Asia is very important. Um, and that the US gives almost nothing to China, which is basically due to domestic laws. In the U.S., they cannot give official USA does not give money to any communist country. Um, but you see that we give about the double of what the U.S. gives to uh, East Asia, and that ASEAN receives quite substantial financial support from the EU. Um, now, this um, financial support to South Asia is sort of classical, more classical development aid, um, anti-poverty measures. Now, in the case of ASEAN, a lot of this money is going into capacity building, including capacity building to enable ASEAN member states to harmonize with the envisaged ASEAN community. Um, and um, we support the ASEAN Secretariat itself, and money goes to through the ASEAN Secretariat or the individual member states of ASEAN, with two exceptions, Singapore and Brunei are not uh, entitled anymore because, because they are too rich. Um, now, when it comes to the representation of the EU in the regional organizations, this is a kind of a confusing uh, graph at first, but you, we try to um, make clear the centrality of ASEAN because most of the security <coughs> organizations and regional organizations, they have their, their focus on ASEAN and then they sort of expand from that with a few exceptions like the six party talks and APEC, their ASEAN is not central. But all the rest, um, ASEAN is sort of the nucleus of, of uh, the organizations. And you see this lonely star 
of the EU in the ASEAN Regional Forum, where the EU um, was a member from the beginning in 1994, and the AIF was founded, the EU immediately uh, became a full member. Um, you also see SISCAP, where uh, this is a second track uh, meeting about security in the Asia-Pacific region, where EU member states sort of were members. There was a consortium uh, in Europe, but then we didn't pay our membership fee anymore, and our membership was suspended by SISCAP. And for several years, I have said this is impossible. We have to, if we show our want to show our position in this Asia, we, we cannot do that. And uh, somebody must have told me. So uh, beginning this year, the SISCA membership of the EU will be revived, and uh, a close delegation will come to the next meeting of SISCA in June. But we are not, we would like to become a member of the East Asian Summit and also of the um, ASEAN Defense Ministers Plus, I have thought. Um, but I think there is a certain sort of reluctance in the region to comply with that because there is no conviction that uh, the EU is really seriously committed. Um, I think there are some positive steps were taken, including the revival of the SISCAP uh, membership, which is also listed here. Uh, I think there is a much stronger effort on the European side to show a higher diplomatic profile in Asia. Um, Lady Ashton called 1912 her Asian semester because she traveled a lot in Southeast Asia. She did attend the um, regional meetings. She gave a speech last year at the Shangri-La meeting. So she is trying to raise the profile of the European Union in Southeast Asia and East Asia. And um, the uh, EU security and foreign and security guidelines for East Asia were revised and published in, in 2012. As I said, we signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation will probably take some time to be ratified. Um, um, and we have come out with some clear statements on the events, the recent events in, in this region. For example, um, there was a statement criticizing China's unilateral declaration of an air defense identification zone in November uh, 2013. And there was also a statement criticizing um, or expressing concern about Abe's visit to the Yasukuni shrine as not being helpful for uh, maintaining peace and stability in, in this region. Um, what also happened is that uh, Lady Ashton signed a joint a statement with uh, Hillary Clinton in 2012 at the ASEAN Regional Forum um, about US-EU cooperation in the Asian Pacific region. And this is a question I raised in the beginning. What the EU really has to think about is do we want to be a part of the pivot? Do we want to play a complementary role? Or do we seek a more independent role in the region? A lot of the uh, issues listed in this uh, joint declaration, uh, for example, climate change. Um, I have my doubts that the US and the EU are really on the same page. Um, and uh, to solve uh, territorial issues peacefully, yes, we can all agree on that. That's a goal. Based on the UNCLOS, difficult because the US has not ratified UNCLOS yet. So, um, I think there we simply have to think about how we how we deal with this dilemma and uh, what we also have to listen to the Asian countries what kind of role they expect from us. <coughs> um, so finally, I come to the conclusions. Uh, despite the, the concerns of um, questions I raised about uh, the. Re 
rebalancing of Tibet to Asia, I think that it's very clear that the U.S. will maintain uh, their strategic position in this region for a long time. Um, whether it's seven aircraft carriers or eight or nine doesn't really make a, a difference. I think there are plans for a sort of a, a more rotating um, system. So I think that's not really an obstacle and uh, the U.S. is not ready to give up its, its leading position in, in the Asia Pacific. The EU, um, I think I have demonstrated that is a strong economic actor. It's also a very strong supporter of regional integration, especially of ASEAN. It's a supporter of capacity building. But in terms of health security, it is a weak actor because there are no European military forces to speak of in this region now being exactly kind of uh, ne negligible. So the EU really only has soft instruments at its disposal. Um, I don't know whether the regions are seen as a soft instrument um, or a hard instrument too, if you want, but, but that's basically the only hard instrument we have. I think the problem of the EU in this region is still the gap between the expectations and the actual performance. What we mean by that, we have strategy papers that um, state very lofty goals. <coughs> and um, I think we, we raise a lot of expectations in Asia. And then we undersell the good things we do um, because um, the capacity building projects, for example, they are not very flashy, they are not sexy, uh, they are not, they're not making the media in, in, in the big way. Um, so the, the performance is sort of nitty gritty, small, hard work things, small projects, and there is sort of a gap between these two levels. Um, and the dilemma for the EU remains how to position itself between China, the US, and ASEAN. Um, I would include ASEAN in that as well, because China is a very important economic partner. Uh, so um, this will remain difficult. Um, do we want to be an independent actor or a partner of the US in the region? And it's also clear that our focus will remain our own neighborhood. And you see that we have a very challenging neighborhood at the moment. Um, it's the Arab Spring, uh, the, the transformation. It's the situation in Syria. Uh, it's still the Balkans and uh, the new situation in Ukraine and with the Crimean Peninsula um, also uh, need a lot of attention from the European Union. So this will remain the focus. Um, and I think it also makes sense because if we cannot project stability and peace in our own neighborhood, we will probably not be a very credible actor in other parts of the world. Um, and the question I have, because uh, sometimes I think that in Asia, most governments still um, think in, in neo-realist terms, so hard power is what counts, um, is the question whether the EU can really play a bigger role in the security issues without hard power in this region. Thank you for your patience and your attention. We are very lucky today also to have the Ambassador Ankh here from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam. Um, we think often when we have colleagues from the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here that they, they're almost like in-house colleagues because we work hand in hand with Vietnam on the, many of the issues that they, we look at, including security issues. I don't know if you would like to come in here, Mr. Ankh. Good. Then, uh, maybe a bit later. 
I'm not sure that they, if I can come with a very quick comment, they, that they, the EU is looking at the, the nitty gritty. They, I think we are looking at the, the machine room, uh, but I would not call that nitty gritty. I would see the EU developments as being very uh, medium term to long term, and therefore when one particular activity is happening around the world or in the neighborhood, it looks like we are not reacting because the reaction is uh, taking time. But in fact, when we do react, as I see it, uh, it is a very substantial reaction, and it's one that will last or often last for, for the years to come. And I would argue that uh, during the last decade, if we look at the security aspect, there has been a major, major shift in the way that the European Union approaches security issues both in the neighborhood and uh, outside the neighborhood. And yet that effect has not been fully transcribed and seen on the way. But I think 10 years from now, oh we see that during those 20 years, there was a major shift in the way that the European Union, European Union, European Union approaches and okay. security issues. Mm. So I see it more that they, we are taking decisions that have an effect for many years to come. And they, therefore, they're taken very cautiously and they're taken gradually. But once they're taken, the impact over time is very substantial. But I will now dominate this discussion. Please, uh, we have Guru here. And uh, she's prepared to answer questions and uh, to uh, listen to comments that you may have. very briefly, uh, that is what is happening in the Ukraine at the moment. Uh, do you think the U.S. would consider this as a very isolated event, or would they use this uh, as a consideration to change the rebalancing uh, and give more focus again to the transatlantic relations and the situation in Central Asia, because that is also, of course, very important for them. Secondly, also in that context, as I know that you are also very much an expert on China, uh, can you tell us how the Chinese look at the events in the Ukraine at the moment? I mean, they have seen that it was relatively simple for Putin to seize the Crimean Peninsula, and uh, we have some islands here in the region not very far away, uh, where China has some special focus on. Would you think this could encourage China also to come to become more active, I would say, when it comes to the territorial disputes here, because they would see that the reactions from the EU, from the US, are very soft, very moderate, and not uh, comply with hard power. Thank you. This Ukraine question is really a bit unfair to give to me, because I'm not an expert on that at all in the US. A reaction. I attended some brainstorming sessions at my institute where the Russia experts and the experts for um, Ukraine and uh, etc. sat together and talked about the possible consequences of uh, these events. And I think that in, in my institute, people are convinced that this will have very big implications for all sorts of things. I mean, starting with something like the, what will happen to the agreement with the land, where, where will Russia's um, willingness to cooperate on anything uh, go? Um, the only uh, person that was not there at the brainstorming was the, the from the Americas group. So I, I actually don't know a lot about the US uh, reaction to, to the events. Um, I mean, there was this leak from the Russians, what well, the U.S. part of the U.S. administration thinks about the EU. Uh, that was very straightforward. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it will sort of influence or weaken this idea of rebalancing to the Asia-Pacific. 
and, and because this is for, from the perspective of the United States, the region of the world where the action is, where the economic dynamism is, etc. So this will, will remain very important. And I mean, there might be some adjustments, but I don't see a basic rethinking. What they probably have to rethink is their, their Russia strategy. And this is why I also deplore very much that the, nobody was there um, at the place known as Unbenu uh, America's group, because I think that um, everything, I mean, Obama did not only become president and and announced very well, balancing, he also announced that we start with, the, with Russia, and uh, I think that simply did not happen at all. And um, what we see now is really the limits um, of, of what we can do in such a case. Um, China's response, uh, <clears throat> at, at the beginning, I, I mean, it's clear it's a dilemma because on the one hand there is the non-interference principle, etc., etc. On the other hand, as you said, um, this sets a precedent that, well, in many ways, from the perspective of China. Um, when we look back a little bit in history at the year 2008, um, when Basically, Russia ruined the opening of the Olympic Games for China by, um, you know, this whole Georgia and South Ossetia thing. Um, the, uh, was it? No. Um, the, uh, I think the Chinese um, made a strategic decision to not support Russia despite a lot of pressure Russia put in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, and also Kazakhstan and the other members of, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization did not support the Russian position. And I think the uh, Chinese logic behind that was, if we allow this kind of precedent um, of you know, a, a, a small part of the country becoming independent with the help of Russia. Um, we will invite um, our own separatists. Um, well, I don't think it's always about I want to um, so it was more, more, more dangerous to allow this president. So, China did not support Russia. But I think in, in this case, there are more factors at play. First of all, think of the referendum, the fact that it was a referendum on the Crimean Peninsula. Taiwan has a referendum which was criticized by China many times. Um, what happens if Taiwan now thinks a referendum might be a good idea? Um, so it, it can work both ways. I mean, there, China might want to take advantage of the situation, or it uh, feels itself also under pressure from this situation. But in this case, they have obviously decided that um, I mean, they abstained in the UN. Um, so this is as good as supporting Russia. They did not want to side with the West. So, I mean, this time around, they are obviously thinking this might have advantages to indirectly at least support the, the Russian position, not to um, endanger the relationship they have with Russia, um, and allow this precedent to happen, because if you I mean, I, I only follow the, the official comments from the foreign ministry in China, and they started to talk a lot about how complicated the historical situation is. And I think this was the first sign that they would sort of step back from this principal stance on non-interference and lean more towards a, a position where they can say, well, historically, the Crimean Peninsula has always been Russian and go in this direction. So 
I think um, here we have a different um, calculus at work, if you want, than in, the, in, the, uh, in 2008. Um, in interest, I haven't heard anything about how Japan uh, reacted to um, the whole, um, change sanctions. events, some sanctions, because they have this bad relationship with Russia. Um, so they will probably also be very careful uh, what joint what sanctions of the EU not to next in twenty one people. Okay. So I'm <coughs> I'm afraid I cannot answer the Ukraine question really well because I mean the situation is so complicated and the implications I mean I remember some of the aspects um, that were discussed at our institute and there is a plan that we put up a series of small comments um, that actually deal with the implications this might have for, for other things. I mean, basically we can say that our pan-European security organizations like uh, OSCE are dead, right? If they weren't before, they're now. very, very close to Russia, might think, okay, this is what is going to happen if we don't comply uh, in, in all uh, respects, or um, Moldovia, same thing. I mean, they, they watch this very carefully. <coughs> the question is what effect will this have on their behavior. Nobody else? Mm -hmm. And the second question that would be regarding the economic influence of the US, the TPP. What do you think is a consideration why China is included in this TPP and the largest economy here? Is it really, as you said, part of the balancing strategy and thus obviously excluding China as a political signal? Or, is it, uh, or are there really economic considerations? And maybe a question to Ambassador Yesen. I know that uh, free trade negotiations are highly confidential, but is there somehow a link between TPP and the EU, Vietnam, FDA? Are you waiting what they conclude on sustainability and property rights and so on before the EU will sign? I think the, the whole uh, TPP thing has evolved over time. Um, first of all, it was a project of four small countries, economies, and it didn't include the US. And then the US sort of jumped on this TPP train and made this their uh, economic integration or FTA project in the region. And I think it's a direct, the Chinese see it as a direct challenge to the um, the APEC, is it APEC, the RCEP, the regional something, yeah. something. Um, it's seen as a, a challenge to China's own um, integration projects, economic integration projects for the region. Um, and TPP in the beginning, it, it's sort of a mixture of economic reasons and political reasons. It depends on who you talk to in the United States. Um, the, the people who deal with FTAs will, of course, cite strictly economic reasons. China cannot comply with the high standards that TPP will set. Therefore, it cannot become a member. And they will say, if China one day will fulfill the standards, they're welcome to join. So this was, but in the beginning it was explicitly excluded. Well, Vietnam probably also doesn't fulfill, um, or has a hard time to fulfill the standards, but might get some exceptions. So, you know, you think there might be a political reason to, 
So now we have two big FTA projects that exclude one of the biggest trade munitions of the world. I wonder how wise that is, uh, TPP and TTIP. Um, China will continue its own efforts um, with RCEP and, and other uh, FTAs. So, um, I mean, I, I think uh, that we had a situation like that in the past where the world was divided in, into trading blocks and it didn't work very well. I don't personally remember because I was not born at the time. So I really wonder how wise it is. So now the, the um, attitude in, in the US has uh, been modified and they say, yeah, if China really um, fulfills the standards, they can join. And there is actually a debate going on within China whether they should throw their hat into the ring um, for TPP. And if you think of the WTO access of China. This was used by the political leaders in China as an instrument to force domestic reforms that they had planned and knew are necessary. And they could use the WTO entry as an external stick to push through these domestic reforms. If the new leadership in China is serious about the reforms, they could use TPP in the same way. Same goes for Abe and Japan, but um, I try to follow the negotiations a little bit in, on, on TPP, and it looks like Japan is going to be the big obstacle. Uh, to the progress of the negotiations, which sort of was to be expected. Yeah, thanks, Maybe I'll come in on this. We have a, the seventh round of the negotiations on the EU Vietnam FTA this week, and we have the Commission at the Court here Monday and Tuesday. <coughs> I think there are a number of elements say that for me at least are interesting. One is that the starting point is that we are not in competition with the TPP and the EU Vietnam FTA. Many of the things that have been discussed within the TPP framework are issues that they, we are very happy to see uh, moving forward. Uh, so you can see to some extent this being two parallel negotiations that both are trying to open up uh, the trading system uh, between a number of different partners. So there's no contradiction on many of the elements. Many of the elements are moving in the same direction. Secondly, sitting here in Hanoi, we often get the impression that the, the press is more interested in the TPP than the FTA. But to find this uh, has a very uh, simple reason. And that is that uh, on the EU level, many of the negotiator, negotiators, if not all the key persons, are not subject to being re-elected by voters. So they will not be re-elected by a popular referendum or vote in their country, but they will be appointed as they are by heads of state and government uh, in Europe uh, eventually. This means that uh, the importance of having the press on our side is very different uh, between the TPP and the FTA. Uh, the uh, FTA negotiations is done by uh, the trade commissioner, He's a lead person on, on our side. Uh, the TPP, there you have a number of trade ministers that are re responding to parties who are eventually responding to, to voters. So there's a different dynamic there. If we look at the economic substance, uh, for me, the FTA is uh, between Vietnam and the European Union, is uh, FTA between two trading partners. And that means that uh, we can go in great depth in that negotiation, <coughs> and we're doing that. TPP is slightly different because you, know, you have a dozen of countries that have to agree. So the, uh, uh, the structure, again, of that type of agreement would typically be quite different. We had a study made two weeks ago by MUTRAP, our EU-Vietnam trade project, where they um, tried to see what is the economic impact of the FTA and the other ongoing trade negotiations between Vietnam and other partners. And the conclusion of that study was that the, the EU Vietnam FTA was very substantial in trade in uh, trade terms. 
we hope that uh, we'll be able to conclude the FTA uh, by the end of this year. We'll see if that materializes. My impression is that the, the CPP is not moving as fast right now as people had expected maybe a year ago, but there's still time to catch up, so we'll see how that develops over the, the year, the next months to come. But the uh, key point being that uh, we don't see the two negotiations as being competing. Uh, and most of the topics, they in fact trying to achieve a very similar goals. Uh, on Gulen's point about uh, what are we doing with uh, China, there are different partners are doing different things. At the, the level of the European Union, uh, I can see that many of the negotiators we have this week here in Hanoi are traveling back to Brussels next week to uh, conduct uh, an investment uh, negotiation with mm -hmm. China. So uh, from the EU point of view, I mean, we are taking steps to consolidate our uh, trading relationship with China. We're not doing an FTA uh, at this point, but we're doing other steps uh, in order to uh, increase the economic relations with China. Maybe I can add to that. It's very clear that, <coughs> and I think China has now explicitly said so, that they want a FTA with the EU. Probably this is also a response to TPP and the challenge they see there. The EU so far has signaled not before this investment agreement is, is done. But if you look at China's tactics, um, they surround us with FTAs, with smaller countries. Switzerland, Iceland, and Norway was under, under, underway the negotiations, but Norway is still in the doghouse for uh, the Peace Nobel Prize, so no negotiations going on at the moment, but Iceland and Switzerland are already uh, done deals. Um, and I think that the EU, there should be maybe a, a discussion whether we need a broader project. I mean, originally, these individual FTAs with Southeast Asia were one EU ASEAN project, which was then shelved because it was too difficult without counterparts on the ASEAN side to do this, or whatever the reason. I think many countries here in the region see it more as um, an expression of the EU's protectionism or something like that. And we should take that seriously and address it. But uh, François Gourmand has written a review of peace where he says, isn't it time for the EU also to think about a broader FTA project, a sort of co competing with TPP, if you want. Um, I think with China, they're debating because you see that uh, Cameron, was it, when he was in China, he basically said, we're ready uh, to, to go into the direction of FTA uh, negotiations with China. Um, the other European countries have yet to be convinced that we are ready to do that. Maybe we take a question. Thank you. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Franz Sensen for the invitation to the lecture. And uh, I would like also to thank Dr. Goodrum very much for a very um, uh, useful uh, presentation, very concise and uh, a lot of uh, uh, thought provoking presentation. Because as I'm from the Foreign Ministry, is handling Vietnam EU's relations, so uh, I'm very much interested in, in, in your presentation. Uh, actually, I, I have uh, one comment and uh, one question to ask for Dr. Goodman's uh, uh, advice. Uh, the, the first thing, my comment is about the uh, sustainability uh, of uh, US uh, rebalancing strategy uh, toward Asia and the Pacific. I think it is still a, 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 a big question. Uh, I completely share with the reason you, you uh, mentioned in your presentation, the reason the second uh, term of the Obama administration, quite a number of things like uh, the personal chain, the 
especially in the uh, State Department uh, from uh, Hillary Clinton uh, to John Kerry, uh, which uh, we know that Mr. John Kerry is uh, very much uh, committed to uh, the Middle East and spent a lot of time and energy uh, to the, the, the region. The second reason you mentioned is also uh, the financial constraint uh, the Obama administration is facing, which lead to the military cuts and uh, other expenditure, and also the uh, budget uh, blockades. But I think apart from from uh, from that, uh, the, the other factors might also affect the uh, sustainability of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, that is the um, the um, uh, the I, I think the the people are also talking of the post uh, uh, Obama's administration because a different uh, president may have uh, different uh, policy and different uh, emphasis. Uh, even though uh, we we know that the shifting. Uh, the, the policy uh, shift toward uh, Asia also enjoyed the bipartisan uh, consensus, but uh, the, the emphasis would be different. And another factor that may also affect uh, the, the shift is the, uh, the, the China, China factor. Uh, now China has uh, developed quite rapidly, and, and, and some people say that this China is. Uh, too weak uh, to be contained, so it may also affect the uh, the, the, the uh, U.S. calculation. And, and uh, as you know, that uh, you also mentioned in your presentation that uh, uh, China and, and and U.S. is also looking for a new partnership, like the, the people talking of G2 uh, relations. So I think that also may affect the the. the U.S. Uh, policy uh, to work uh, Asia, so, so that's that's my my, my comment on the uh, sustainability of <coughs> U.S. rebalancing. Uh, and the second thing, that the question I would like to uh, ask for your for your advice, uh, as you know that Vietnam is a strong supporter uh, of, of of stronger uh, ASEAN EU uh, relations. Uh, but in your presentation, you also mentioned the strength and the weaknesses of EU when talking about the uh, enhancing the interaction, uh, forging stronger relations between uh, ASEAN and EU, which I uh, fully share. So in 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 that, uh, but but I also believe that a stronger uh, relationship between ASEAN and EU will be in the interest of both uh, EU and ASEAN. So what, uh, so what are the advices you can give to uh, Ambassador Franz Jensen on the EU side and, and, and for us on, on ASEAN? Uh, what could we do more uh, in order to, uh, to, to uh, have the stronger uh, ASEAN-EU relations? And, and I think I, the, maybe the, the, the third one, which is not uh, uh, completely related to the topic you, you presented today, but I know that uh, uh, you are the China expert. So I may also ask for your, your comments on the fact that in, now with regard to China nowadays, when you are talking about the territorial claim, so it is clearly seen that China is uh, um, more and more uh, assertive uh, in the region, and and some people, I think, some maybe some internal discussion in China may uh, say that uh, it's now the time when China is uh, uh, hiding and waiting over. It's time for uh, China to to to, to, to uh, show its strength and thing like that. But but because of that, uh, uh, that uh, attitude of, of the Chinese, it also brought about some, uh, I think, negative uh, uh, response, uh, maybe uh, from uh, partly the, 
the, the, the, the U.S. in-house presence in the region could be explained for the assertiveness of China or the suspicions of uh, some Chinese neighbor could also result from assertiveness. So what do you think that uh, in, in, in future China may uh, change the, the course of uh, doing things uh, or it will continue the trend of become more assertive mm -hmm. on uh, international issue and also on regional issue? Uh, thank you. Regional issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much um, for the comment and, and the two questions. Um, I think on, on the, uh, your comment um, is, is correct. There are these two question marks with the post-Obama administration. I still think um, it might um, be different than the nuances, but not in the substance. I think the commitment to the Asia-Pacific region is not in question by any a political party in, in the US, but for example, I believe that the Republican Party could do without the strong engagement in regional organizations. This was never their cup of tea. Uh, they consider the regional organizations more or less as talk shops, and, um, but maybe something like ADMM Plus um, even is for the Americans um, has some attraction, and the East Asian Summit, I think it's also about prestige. So it's it's not only the regional engagement that counts, but also the, the profile for the US in, in being a member in that. So maybe even this will not change. Um, and the China factor, that's, that's a big issue. I mean, this first uh, trip Hillary Clinton made to China, she said, how do you speak to your banker? And this situation has not changed. I mean, China is still holding most of the uh, US treasury. So there is a, a very strong interdependence, an economic interdependence that, for example, never existed between the United States and the Soviet Union. So how does this factor into the whole relationship to be a strategic competitor um, and at the same time economically so uh, interdependent. I think sometimes, I mean, these analogies with Europe a hundred years ago um, are all wrong, but there are some similarities, including that um, the US, and I think that's their real dilemma here in the region, they are also facing a problem because small alliance partners like the Philippines, they probably are more adventurous than they would be without the US in their back. And I think the, the Scarborough show has shown that I'm sure that US has signaled the Philippines don't go too far. We will not go into a war with China over a couple of rocks. Um, and, but with Japan, this is a, a different quality and a different level. So I think for the US, the challenge will be how to maneuver and how to balance the expectations from their alliance partners, signal that the alliances are reliable, but at the same time prevent these countries from you know, venturing forward. Um, and expecting the U.S. to back them up. So I think the situation is, is kind of dangerous at the moment. Uh, there are certain risks involved. Um, the the uh, new Chinese leadership has come out with this concept uh, of a new type of major power relationship, which they say applies first of all to the U.S., but also to Russia, which is sort of the model and uh, the EU is also considered as a major power. Maybe we don't <laughs> see quite in that, those terms. But the problem with that concept is that the fundamental condition, uh, maybe, is that the new type of major power relationship is that you respect the core interests of the other side. Now, what does this imply in the case of the US and China? 
China says we have always respected the core interests of the United States. So it's the US that has to change. And as we know, the definition of core interest has changed quite substantially over, over the years. So um, maybe I take the, the last uh, question together with that since I'm speaking about China already. I, I actually believe that Deng Xiaoping's um, slogan of keeping a low profile is over. Nobody says so in China, but this phase is over. They, it, it's quietly put to arrest. Um, what I expect is that you will see positive initiatives, but a hardening of the stance in, in the territorial issues. So we have already seen at this APEC summit, where I have showed the blue photo, there was this big announcement of a, a Asian Development Bank for infrastructure. And I think this is, um, I, you also have the concept of the new Silk Road. You have, um, it's called One Road, One um, Belt. So you have the Silk Road Belt, which is Central Asia, sort of reaching out to Turkey and Eastern Europe, so the 16 plus one format. Uh, that China has just founded with Eastern European countries, even that comes into play here. So you have the, the venturing out to the West, and then you have the Hilu, the, the one road, the, silk, the maritime Silk Road. Um, so it's about economic integration by building infrastructure, um, by supporting the, the hardware, the, the underlying hardware for economic integration. So this is the positive initiative, if you want. Um, the negative is that on the territorial issues, I don't see any, um, the, the attitude of the 1990s is not coming back. I mean, I think that in the 90s, Vietnam has struck a quite good deal with China um, in the Gulf of Tonkin, but, and also, these uh, solutions of the land border with Russia, with Central Asia, with Vietnam, basically only India is, is still, um, uh, there is still a conflict. Um, but I think that China is no longer willing to make these compromises. And I mean, what they try in ASEAN is what they do with Europe too. It's a divide and conquer strategy. <coughs> they refuse to discuss this on the ASEAN within the ASEAN context and try to do it bilaterally, arguing that they can find better solutions, uh, more satisfying solutions based on, on the bilateral approach um, instead of, of a, a regional approach or a multilateral approach. So I think if you, we will see these two things go in parallel, a renewed charm offensive if you want I think that China has also uh, realized that it cannot open five fronts, five foreign policy fronts at the same time. So they have made up with South Korea, the, uh, have improved the relationship, which was also um, in crisis. They have improved the relationship with your country, but the Philippines and Japan, no. Um, and final question on, on the, uh, ASEAN. I think um, I, I presented that to the students yesterday. Whether it wouldn't be a good idea, I mean, we're producing these strategy papers all the time. As far as I know, not all the time, but every couple of years. As far as I know, China is the only country in Asia that has produced a EU strategy paper. Or do you know any others? We had the, the Tim program from 2005 made by Vietnam? I think it would be a good idea if ASEAN uh, would produce a EU strategy paper of their own, where they say what they expect from the European Union, how they see the relationship. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't even have to be published or anything, but uh, it would be um, something to, to sort of also have a, a common framework. I mean, these security guidelines, 
make it easier for Lady Ashton to make a statement on the ADIC because there is a framework set in these guidelines and so she can make the statement without consulting all the, oh, it's easier to reach consensus among the member states. So maybe something like that would be a good idea. Um, and then what you probably are arriving at is, is it time for an EU representative to, to ASEAN? Um, this is under discussion as far as I know. I think that would also be a good idea. We haven't mentioned ASEAN at all. We have one question. Oh, we have, have more questions. So, yeah. well, not many ideas, but at least one. Okay, thank you very much for the very informative and interesting um, uh, presentation um, from the South African Embassy. My interest is, was just to perhaps get your opinion on what do you think uh, of the EU's strength? Does it, do EU countries operate more effectively as individual countries or as a union? You know, now the, in the world we see a number of challenges that require a, a superpowers to, to react. A, one example <coughs> was the situation in Central Africa where a, we saw France breaking ranks. I don't know whether they were doing, they were getting to Central Africa a, through the EU concern. whether the EU functions effectively as a union or as individual countries, and what does that do to the uh, strength and sustenance of the union and also the future expansion? <clears throat> well, that's a difficult question, and I, <laughs> maybe friends will contradict me uh, after what I say what I say. Um, I think it's clear even to the biggest EU member states that alone they do not bring enough weight to the global table to make a big difference. So I think on the global level, um, if the EU stands united, we probably have the best chance to change anything. Now with these missions, uh, like the one in, in Central Africa, that's a, a different thing. And the EU has only just started to define this kind, do this kind of missions. I mean, they have done some of the missions I showed on the, the map for, for a very long time. Uh, but often, uh, EU missions start by one member state taking the initiative and then trying to, to gather support for that. But of course the member states will not disappear from the, the political um, picture in the world. I mean, look at every international organization. In the UN Security Council, you have the UK and France and not um, a EU seat. And if you ask me, my personal opinion, Germany should not say we want uh, now the German ambassador can give me this look. I don't think that we should ask for a permanent seat in the Security uh, Council. We should say we are for an EU uh, seat. But France and the UK will say over oh, our dead bodies. The G20, the G8, um, everywhere it's the member states that still in the G20, yes, there is also the EU. but. It's very difficult to overcome this. And um, I think we're, we're doing steps in this direction to become more effective. But the problem is that if the member states are divided, for example, Libya, Germany abstained in the UN Security Council and refused to take any part in this um, mission, right? Um, now, I think um, the, in the African um, EU missions, 
um, some other member states decided that they would join the effort. And as long as it's under a EU roof, I mean, the initiative can always come from member states. The Arche monitoring mission in, in Indonesia was, um, as far as I know, a Swedish initiative. So, I mean, nothing against individual member states taking the initiative. But I, um, I must say it will remain difficult because there is no European army. We also need to cut down on our defense expenditures. So the most logical thing to do would be a sort of division of labor in terms of uh, military capabilities. But if you do that, and then the countries or a country with a special capability that is needed does not want to participate in the mission, you have a problem, right? So there are practical, um, very practical considerations that, that come into play here. Um, so it depends whether you speak about a, a global issue like non-proliferation or climate change, uh, where I think we more or less uh, have a united position of, of the EU, or this kind of missions, which is on a, on a different level, where you need negotiations before you can venture out. It's not so easy, because it's a, everything that has to be agreed by 30 actors, 28 member states, and I would say the EU level is even uh, one actor, there are seven. Um, agreement means time. So if effective means very fast, probably one member state, it's easier, it's more effective. But if you talk about legitimacy, etc., we and, and the, the kind of weight we bring to the table, it's a different story. I'm sure that uh, Franz wants to comment on that one. Yeah. I think for me, you don't mind me putting it like that. I think many member states, they think the most effective EU would be one where they could decide on Bahar Paul 28. Um, there's, of course, always a balance between uh, the different interests of 28 member states. There's also the issue that they, the 28 member states have very different sizes, going from half a million up to more than 80 million people. So the way that they, they bring to the table in terms of economic impact, uh, historical tradition, and so on, is, is quite different. But I think, despite all the, uh, the, the press writing we get about the European Union, again, if you take a 5, 10, 15 year perspective, it's a very different union we have today compared to what it was 10, 15 years ago. If you look at the, the Euro crisis, what has it resulted in at the end of the day? more integration, more Europe, uh, more European regulations in the areas such as banking, and even budgetary issues with the uh, United States. So the, for me, the trend is very clear. And that is that on many of these issues, the European countries and 28 member states are due to the developments in the world becoming more and more integrated. Production is becoming more integrated. The political cooperation is becoming more integrated. The crisis in Ukraine is not seen as a crisis that affects only one or two or three member states, but it's seen very, seen very clearly as one that affects all 28, and therefore there has to be a response from all 28. It may not be the response that they, some are looking for right now, because we do not have a European army, um, and there are other issues uh, also uh, the UN Security Council has mentioned, but uh, the tendency for an integrated response is, is for me very, very clear. And uh, we will see more of that as the uh, time goes on because that uh, is the way that if the world is developing, we are becoming more integrated. And we see that also at the EU 28 level. Very clear. Thank you very much for coming this morning. I hope you have enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed listening to Kuru. And then uh, we will continue with the uh, Aaron and the uh, colleagues to invite speakers from Europe from time to time.
in order to uh, bring a, a European perspective directly from European capitals uh, to Hanoi and the uh, other cities in Vietnam, partly to you here as its group, but also at the uh, universities and, uh, and other institutions where we feel that uh, an exchange of ideas is useful. Thanks to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for supporting us in this, and uh, looking forward to see you next time.